I'm Aaron Hustledge. I've been doing system administration since forever, and I'm currently a solution engineer at Docker, which means I go talk to folks and, and tell them to buy stuff. So buy stuff? Okay, now I'm done with that part of my job and I can do other things. So uh, who, who here has done stuff with Docker right now? Like has, has played with it? And is anybody using it in production? Well, you're all fired, just leave, <laughs> you're done. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about why Docker exists, what we're doing with it, um, what it is and how to get started. And then hopefully, I'm gonna try to rush through this a little bit because I want you to be able to ask questions if you have any, I mean, does anybody have questions already? Oh good. Um, so uh, why Docker? So right now we're in this world where everybody wants to do everything faster, which is always, right, this isn't new. Um, there are large environments out there. You know, I was at a customer the other day that had 6,000 applications, which is a little absurd, um, that they have to deal with and run every day. Um, the, the, these environments are growing, they're not shrinking, and even with app ra rationalization and stuff like that, projects that are out there, people still make new stuff. Um, and so we've entered a new world where scaling is really, really important and, um, and iterating very quickly is very important. So before you went through this whole like waterfall thing where you had specifications and you had implementation and you know, the, it, the whole cycle was very prescriptive, it was very slow on purpose, like that worked at the time. Um, you have a big, a big monolithic application like SAP, you have to like do things a certain way or the thing doesn't work at the end of it. Um, even SAP is changing now, by the way. But um, these large things have been kind of blown up over the last few years with new, new technologies um, for you know, front-end dev, you know, like Node.js and new JavaScript frameworks as, as, and back-end stuff. Like, Big data change, uh, big data, no SQL databases, the cloud, the cloud. Um, it's not raining, so I don't know. Um, but we talk about minimum viable product. We just wanna get something out there, see what works, and then iterate over top of that over and over again. And that, that goes for internet companies and it now goes for enterprises like Fidelity, right? We want to make sure that applications can just go um, and that teams are very quick and that you're never finished, right? That we don't wanna make sure you're never finished, but that's just the way it works, right? Like people, you know, you're finished today, but you're not finished, right? There's always more to do, but this also um, makes things pretty hard, right? So before we had a lot of, you know, big environments, you had one language, you had Java, right? For the most part in, in the enterprise, and then you had, um, one framework, you know, one database, one server, or one set of servers, and you know, maybe a dev environment if you're lucky. And getting a dev environment took you three weeks and cost $40,000 and never worked at the end until you iterated over that 30 times with some IT guy who was really sad. And then today we have a lot of environments, we have a lot of languages. Developers um, of this generation uh, want to just write code. They don't want to think about corporate standards. They don't want to think about junk that they don't feel is, is sort of in their remit, right? They want to write code to do a certain thing at a certain time and make sure that thing runs, right? So there's so many tools out there. Like picking one is impossible at an organizational level for the most part. So you have to allow for this sort of iteration and change to go on all the time. And then everybody has their own environment. I can run, you know, all of, you know, my, my application on this laptop right now if I want to, right? And so we wanna allow for that to occur, but we're also seeing new trends like c continuous integration, which isn't new, but is, it has evolved into something that is really important to, to DevOps. And, um, be able to spin up ephemeral environments, you know, and, and, and this changes the way you do deployment too, right? So you have new versions once in a while and the old thing, it took you forever to upgrade something because you had to make sure everything was lined up and, and that was a whole other project in itself. And scaling 
you just bought bigger iron, right? You didn't, you didn't spread it out as much over a bunch of different servers. You just bought a bigger box, right? And so that costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of planning. It becomes complicated. Um, today, we want to just deploy something. Um, infrastructure is less relevant today than it ever has been from a application perspective. Um, I know that's gonna tick a lot of people off who love their hardware, but that's the truth, right? We wanna be able to bring up an environment and run it anywhere very quickly. And that means we need some new tools and that's where Docker comes in, right? So Docker is a way to execute containers. It's a way to build them, uh, the images. It's a way to distribute images amongst an organization or the world and it has a humongous ecosystem built up around it, right? So there, there's a tool for the job. If, if Docker doesn't make it, then somebody else does. Um, so it's kind of like a hypervisor for containers, right? But a, a container is not a virtual machine. We don't, Docker doesn't virtualize anything, right? We just put it in a box. We just take your code and we stick it in this box and you can ship that box wherever you want. And as long as you're running Linux and soon Windows and soon multiple platforms as well, you'll be able to run that container no matter where it is, right? So you could think of it as a lightweight virtual machine, but don't because it's wrong. Um, <laughs> and so I, I'm just gonna run a container right here. So if I do Docker run, uh, what, oh. I did download this earlier. I don't know what happened. I know, it's not too big, so we'll be fine. So this is going to, so this is my Mac. It's happy doing its thing, Mac-y thing. But it's also got a virtual machine on it that has Linux. It's running a, speci a special Linux distribution that Docker makes called boot to Docker, which is very thin, small, and, and it lets me run Docker containers on my Mac. This also works on Windows too, so you don't have to be like Linux-y to do this, you can just run it. Um, and so now, I'm, so now I've run Linux, right? So if I look that, oh wait, I'm not a virtual machine, right? This kernel, um, right, can you see here? It's too small, okay. So, so this kernel is, is actually the kernel that's running in the virtual machine, in the VM. It's not a new kernel. I didn't boot an operating system, right? If I look at here, I see I have bash, right, in my, in my process space. So what we've done is we've taken, yeah? Right. So, um, sorry about that, thank you for letting me know. Um, so if you look here, this has its own process space, right? It looks like a virtual machine, right? It also has its own network, right? So I'm running a network in here that has a uh, IP address of 172.17.03, right? This is um, just a private network on the Linux host, right? I, I can see what I've mounted, right? But I've mounted a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter. And then slash is, is its own thing, right? So I have my own mount points. I have my own network. I have my own everything but I'm not a virtual machine because I'm sharing the same kernel as I am with the rest of the world on that host, right? So uh, it's kind of similar to virtualization, but it's not anything like virtualization, <laughs> to confuse you more. Um, so like I said, it looks and feels like a VM. You run standard Unix processes just isolated from everything else. So we use namespaces, C groups or control groups, and um, copy on write file systems to do this. Um, so starting a container is very quick. You saw me download an image called Ubuntu, which is Ubuntu 14.04. Um, it's, it's not really Ubuntu, it's enough to make Ubuntu look, make the image look like Ubuntu to, you know, I can go in here, I can run apt get, uh, update, right? And it'll go and run just like it would on a regular Ubuntu box, right? My host operating system is not Ubuntu, it's something else, right? But, so 
what we do with Docker is we launch Unix processes inside of a box. That's all we do. You're not booting an operating system. You're not doing anything special from the process's perspective. The process runs inside of an environment that it knows and loves, right? So Ubuntu in this case, you could do it with RHEL, you could do it with you know, mom's Linux or whatever, right? Um, and then we also provide a, an easy way to build this, right? So, you know, putting this all together is sort of weird, right? You, you could do it manually, you could sort of take a snapshot of your file system and then kind of move it around. But then we provide you an abstraction called a Docker file. And this is a, an insanely complicated one. It's actually not that complicated. But basically, we, um, this is to build a Jenkins server, right? So um, it's, a, it's a server I'm running in the cloud right now. I can spin up 1,000 instances of Jenkins, which is a continuous integration system, in about five seconds um, without a problem. And all it is, really, is a list of commands. It's, almost a shell script, um, and it just says, install this stuff inside the container, and then at the end of it, um, I can't bring this higher because VI, um, is uh, a command that I run, right? So I'm just running um, Jenkins <laughs> inside of this container, right? Um, and, and so that, that, that sort of defines it, and then I can go build it if I want. I'm not gonna do it here, but, but I'll show you in a second how to build something else. So the Docker file is just a recipe. Um, it's simple, like I said, it's simple to, to learn. It's very fast because everything is cached. Um, once you build it once, and if you build it again on that same machine, if, if, it, if nothing changed between those, it, it, it's not gonna rebuild them, because why? And it's going to make sure that you know everything builds as quickly as possible, um, and so it lets you have your cake and eat it too. Um, unlike a lot of things where you're you're sort of always rebuilding or you're always trying to catch up, right? Um, and trying to poo-poo Chef Salt Fansible or whatever, it's it's a different way of looking at the world than what they had, right? So let's look at this. So. Um, and if, and if you notice, like, each of these things is a, these run, add, whatever, these are just commands at the top that tell Docker what to do. And each one of those results in a layer. So we snapshot the file system at each one of these points. And then mount them all together as a, uni a union file system. So the changes, it's called copy on write. So I, I have a base image, in this case it's Ubuntu, and that's always static. Each layer is immutable. So once it's built, it's built. You can build a new layer, right, if you change, if you change it, but you can't change, you're not actually changing the layer, you're just replacing it. Um, so it's just a, a, a straight tree of, of images that are mounted from the top down so that you see a consistent image of your file system. And so I have a little, oh, I'm still in the thing. Um, I have a little, um, application here that's just a little web server um, written in Go because, and um, the, the, the language is totally irrelevant to Docker, it doesn't care. Um, but it allows, it, it's just a little web server that shows a picture of the Docker logo and then connects to a database and updates a timestamp. It's dumb on purpose. Um, and then there's a Docker file for it, right? Uh, And let me, let me do that again. And that's it. There's two lines in it. <laughs> because we, we have some tricks in here so that, uh, called on build that says, when you build a container from me, go run these commands. Right? And that's all this is doing. So this is compiling a Go application when I build a container from it. And then I'm just saying expose port 8080 so that I can run the thing. So if I run docker build, uh, so that went and downloaded a little Postgres connector and uh, compiled the Go code and then, and now I have a container image called, what did I call it? Blah, so docker images. Um, 
a lot of them in here somewhere that I could grab. There it is. So this is the culmination of all those different layers of stuff and it creates this image called blah. And then I can run that image on its own. Um, does that make sense? It's a very simple way of taking something and having a consistent development environment. This image is the same here as it is on a server in Timbuktu. And that's important because you don't want your development environment to be different from your production environment if you can help it, right, in terms of what's running. Now, you may have scaling differences and stuff like that, but in the end, you're wanting to run the same code that you have here out there somewhere. And so the Docker file, the, the way that we do builds is, and the way that images are immutable makes that possible. The entirety of all of these um, dependencies, all the language libraries, all that stuff is contained inside of this thing and that thing's not gonna change. And that thing can be shipped quickly. So um, the problem, another problem we tried to solve is that virtual machine images are giant, right? Because you have this entire operating system with hardware drivers and a bunch of other crap um, that you don't want, you don't need. It's different, it, it's irrelevant really to the application. The application could care less for the most part. They just need a place to like, even if it needs a device driver on the system, it just needs a place to point, right? It doesn't need, doesn't really care from a hardware perspective or whatever, right? So since we're not virtualizing anything, we don't need hardware stuff. We handle logs in a separate way, so you don't need syslog, you don't even need init, right? You don't even need a process controller inside the, the thing. If all you're running is a single process, it doesn't matter. Um, and so, like I said, one layer is one build step. So each of those little li lines in the Docker file is just a layer in the file system. And then, okay, but how do you um, get that thing and move it around, right? F f historically, you would take a VMDK or a, a disk image of some sort and you'd tar it up with some configuration metadata and you'd SCP that or sync it off to some server somewhere and it'd take you four hours or whatever because you were at home on your crappy Time Warner cable link and, and you know, it was awful, right? So um, we needed another way to do that, right? So we took a, a cue from Git and oh yeah, and you had to remember the, the magic, right? So the, the magic options, uh, we all love those. It's sysadmins, oh crap, how do I do that? I don't know, Google it, okay, um, mostly. So the solution is we have a registry. Just like you would have with a Git repository, you have a place to th throw stuff, right? So we have a, an open API. In fact, everything with Docker, Docker is open source, so you could all obviously read the code. But easier is we have APIs for everything. In fact, our own client, our own tools use the same APIs that we publish over HTTP. So, um, Everything is, is just open and easy to deal with. So you can write your own clients to it, you can write your own servers for it. Um, and, and we have a public service called Docker Hub, which is where you can push and pull images to the world. So that Ubuntu image that you saw me download earlier came from Docker Hub. Um, and, and then we also have an uh, on-premise registry called Docker Trusted Registry that you can run locally um, or in your own private world that isn't shared with everybody else. Um, and so, so I'm gonna, actually I'm gonna skip this part and I'll show you the rest in a minute, but we have over 100 official images. So just about every Linux distribution is, is up on Docker Hub, um, lots of databases, um, web servers, stuff like, yeah. So the question was, where does the data go in a database because container images are immutable? When you run a container, we create a read-write layer um, that, so that, that things can still write, um, but you can also map in uh, a file system from the host as well to store data, um, which is sort of the recommended way to do it because then you know where it is and you can manage that. Um, 
you know, just about any programming language is up there uh, in some official capacity. The, the, our official images are vetted and maintained by the people that write the software. So they upload these to a Git repository, tell us how to, you know, and, and they're basically just ready to go images, and then we import them and sign them, um, and, and so you know that they're the real deal. Um, and then, you know, there's a countless number of contributed images. So people have some new tool they want to try, they'll build a Docker image and throw it up there, and you can go in and search for it and download it um, fairly easily. Um, about 100,000 GitHub repos have a Docker file in them. Um, we have nice little metrics inside that we would watch this stuff because uh, we're evil in Big Brother or something. No. Um, we we want to know what people are doing, right? <laughs> Uh, there are over a thousand contributors to the Docker code on GitHub. Um, there's hundreds and almost there's probably thousands of projects integrating with Docker from 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 startup stuff all the way up to giant corporations like IBM and Oracle and CSD and stuff like that. And then we have our own tools as well that come with uh, in a, in what, what we call the Docker toolbox. So we have Docker Machine, which lets you start a host, and, and it talks to about 20 different cloud providers. So you just pass in your keys, and it creates a VM out there that has Docker already installed in it, complete with TLS keys and all of that so that it's all secure. You're not gonna like broadcast the world that, hey, you know. And actually, there are scripts out there, script kitties out there, because I had a machine that I had open with Docker um, un unencrypted. Um, and it got owned very quickly. It was interesting, it was sort of an experiment. I was curious to see if there were any script kiddies out there doing stuff. So they'll run a Docker machine that goes and does Bitcoin or whatever, whatever the heck these people wanna do. Um, it, it was, and then like five minutes later, Amazon emails me, hey, your machine's been hacked. And so, you know, I felt good, you know, it was cool. Um, um, that means Docker has arrived. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you're worth hacking. Um, we have Docker Compose, which I'll show you in a second. It lets you manage these applications. Applications are very rarely just one container, right? You have, you have a service to do X, and you have a service to do Y, and you have a database, and you have other things, and you need to make sure they all talk to each other, and that's what Compose does. And then we have Swarm, which clusters host together in a really insanely, stupidly easy way. Um, and we've actually been doing some really awesome scale tests, and I can't tell you about yet. There'll be blog posts, but, um, the scale numbers that we're getting in Docker Swarm are really good too. So um, all very cool little tools. And let's talk a little bit about Docker Compose, which will also show you more of the Docker, the push and pull to Docker registry. Um, so we're gonna put together a little app from multiple containers, this demo app that I showed you. We're gonna show you how, in this one file, we'll define how to build the image, how to run it, what the port mappings are and how to link the containers together, right? So, so this is a Docker Compose file, and yes, we, we you know, it's a, it's a simple YAML file. So if you know Ansible or something like that, you know this stuff. Very simple. If you don't know Ansible, you should probably go learn that too because it's freaking awesome. Anyway, um, so we have two containers in this app. We have app, which I'm, I'm you know, descriptive, I'm not interesting. And then uh, database, which is down below, and I'll show you that in a second. So this says, go into the demo PQ directory and build this image. That's all it has to do. And then entry point is just what command am I gonna run? So I'm gonna run bash with the um, and I'm gonna sleep for five seconds because Postgres takes a few seconds to start up. Um, otherwise, we would just run the app and it would fail because it wouldn't know how to connect to Postgres. And we've written our app very poorly so it doesn't sit there and wait, you know, because that would be sane and so we're not sane and so we just make this work this way. So, and then there's some environment variables that you can pass into the container as well. So, you know, we can, this is a, a simplistic way of doing configuration. 
management uh, external to a container. So when you start the container, it goes and reads these environment variables. The application is gonna read these environment variables and then know what to do. Um, um, and then it's gonna link to this database container. That's all you have to do to say, I'm gonna go talk to that database container within a, a YAML uh, compose file. And I'm gonna expose port 8080, and then I'm gonna map that to port 8080 on my host as well. So the way that ports work is everything is natted in a default Docker environment. So the host has an IP, uh, has a bridge that has an IP. Everybody connects to that, all the containers connect to that bridge and then have outbound NAT to get to a, uh, the outside world, but also inbound port address translation to get to them directly. And so Docker manages all that very transparently. It's very easy, you just do dash P and tell it what port you want. Um, but we're, we're doing it explicitly here because we wanna make sure that I can like run it. Uh, <laughs> and, no, and I don't have to like jump through hoops to get to it. Um, and then the next container is the DB image, which you saw referenced up here, and that just is Postgres. And it's just the latest image that's on Docker Hub, right? I don't really care what version it is. I'm not, all I'm doing is an insert. I don't really give a damn about any of it, right? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna set my username and password so that I can actually connect to it. And then it's gonna expose port 5432, which is the normal Postgres port. The nice thing about this is there, there is no public port mapping for this database at all. I can't connect to this database remotely. I have to get, um, I have to connect in, I have to like have an, a shared network with it somehow to connect to it. Um, so there's a little extra security, hey, feature um, there as well. So if I wanna, do this, I can do docker compose build, and that will rebuild an image which it didn't actually have to rebuild, so it took like no time because I just built it. Um, and then I could do docker compose up. And then the nice thing about docker compose is it also spits the logs out to you. So if you um, see here, it started the database and then it and it started the application. You probably can't see at the bottom, but it started the application too. And then I can go and I can hit it on, on my thing, and if I reload it, it writes a new, um, a new timestamp to my database, right? And then if I, I could do Control C, and it'll stop it, and then if I run it again, it's gonna restart the database in the same place, because it didn't, it just stopped the container, it didn't delete it. So I have all that data still there. So wait five seconds, and then the app will start again. But this, this makes it, one second and I'll get to you. Um, this is, the nice thing about Docker Compose is that you can define the application and that application can run anywhere, right? So if I have an arbitrarily complex application with five different containers or whatever, I can run it all locally make sure it works, and then ship that code somewhere else. Um, so if I reload it here, see the database is still there and I'm just adding to it. Right? It's, it's not that interesting. Um, so that's how Docker Compose works. It's very flexible, very easy to use. A developer can use it, a sysadmin can use it, anybody can use it. And and you can have you know, multiple Docker Compose files if you want to do different things. Um, so how do you get started with it? So like I said earlier, we have a thing called Docker Toolbox. Um, it contains VirtualBox, it contains uh, Docker Compose, Docker Machine, Docker Swarm, uh, and the Docker uh, command as well as something called Kitematic, which is a nice GUI. Um, and it works on just about, you can download it for Windows and Mac today. There'll be a Linux version too soon. Um, although for Linux, it's pretty easy to install. So there's a shell script that you can download at get.docker.com. And if you're brave or stupid or whatever, you can do, you can just curl it down and install it with a, a shell. I don't know, whatever. I'm pretty happy with doing it that way. But. I, I also know that the people that run our servers, so I'm not that worried about it. <laughs> um, but installing Docker is trivial and, and very quick. Um, 
And then there are docs galore. There are also really bad docs that are out there on the world about how to do Docker the wrong way. Don't read them, just stop. And then read docs.docker.com. Um, and then, you know, we've got a, and then we've also got training.docker.com, which shows you the right way to do things as well. Like I said, Docker, <laughs> Docker containers are not virtual machines. If you run them like virtual machines, you're in for a world of hurt. Stop it and like watch this video. Um, and it's three one hour videos, they're great, super cool. Um, and then if you have an app and you wanna start working on this stuff after you've learned how to do it the right way, go um, write a Docker file for it and write a Docker Compose file for it and play with it and use it in development, right? The, the nice thing about Docker is you're using the same thing in, in your laptop or in your desktop or whatever as you are in production. We solve a problem of it worked on my laptop. You know, that just goes away because it did work on your laptop, which means it's gonna work anywhere, right? So yeah, whatever, use it. You know, and then set up CI and CD, right? So it's pretty easy, you can do it. And then once you grow into something where you need scale and you need stuff, the more automation around it, you know, Docker Compose is a great automation tool. You can actually use things like Ansible or whatever to start containers as well, right? But once you get into something where you get, you need some scale, run Docker Swarm and connect a bunch of different machines, right? Um, let me see how much time I got. Oh good, I got time. So um, I wanted to show you the next step in this demo. Um, so if I, if I make a change um, to this index, to this template, right? Where is it? I'm just gonna make a trivial change. And then I, I can, um, I can run it here, whoops. So I'm rebuilding the container, and then I'm gonna run it here just to make sure I'm happy with it. And you notice that Docker Compose is smart too. So it, didn't, it knows I didn't change the database at all. So it's gonna just keep the old container, and then it's gonna create a new container for the new image that I just built. Um, and so, let's see here. Oh, I think I have to get rid of the data. I wanted you to be able to see it, so there we go. So at the bottom it says, hi, I hate Tio. If, if you can't see it, trust me. Because um, there's not much I can do about it. But, um, so if I'm happy with that, I can do a git commit, right? This is a git repo. And I can push it to, uh, I'm gonna push it to GitHub right now. Because um, GitHub is awesome. I think they sponsored this thing too. So, um, which I didn't even know. Um, so I have this, so as soon as that git, yeah, there you go. Um, as soon as that git thing, it hit a webhook on Jenkins right here and it built, it's building a container. So it's, it's taking that code that I just made, building this container, right? And so I can look at the log, if you like, so, and then it's gonna run a test against it, right? So I have another Docker Compose um, file in there, well, it jumps around, but I have another Docker Compose file called test that starts it up so that I can run a test against it. And all the test is is a curl, basically. I'm not doing anything special. Um, and, then, and, then, and then I made it too big. Um, and then, uh, and then it, now it's gonna deploy it to four different servers on Amazon it doesn't matter where it is. This is all running in Amazon. Every single thing you're watching here is running inside a container. So Jenkins is in a container, the database, all that stuff. So it's deploying this now to, um, to those four servers and it's doing it uh, 10 times. So um, I did it, we did it with a shell script so it's easy to deal with. But so 10 times it's running 10 in instances of this. There's a, a wonderful little program called interlock which starts in Gen X 
and reloads um, and rewrites its configuration file based on events from the cluster. So I pass in a little environment variable that says here's, here's my host name that I'm gonna listen on and, and GenX already has the load balancer configured. So I don't even have to do anything. And now I have, um, I have that, but I also have high ETO. And I didn't touch a thing, I just ran it. I just committed code, right? So, and then the thing that gets promoted is not the code anymore. It's not a tarball, it's not a data bag, which is the worst thing I've ever heard anyway, by the way, it sounds really disgusting. But um, <laughs> the, no offense to chefies, it's just a terrible word. But um, the, it, it, it's a Docker image. That's it. So what this did was with one git commit, it built a container, tested it. When it was happy with that, it pushed the container image to Docker Trusted Registry on Amazon, which is firewalled off. It's not even accessible um, outside of our little VPC, and then deployed it um, to a load balanced environment with zero downtime, right? It just did it. And now, and, and now I have this in my dev environment. This is on, like I said, four machines, but but I also have you know a test environment, right? And I can promote that by just running the same job again and changing one parameter. So if I go back here and I run this and I pick and I tag everything with the the git sha, so I know where it came from, right? Um, you, you know, we have, a, we have a, a way to deploy this to software, to EC2, it's all using Docker, so it doesn't matter, you know, we, these are arbitrary things, right? So I have a, cl the cluster actually has machines and software and EC2. Um, I just, I'm using EC2 because it's all local and it's faster. Um, and this is the little JSON blob that configures my web server to talk on that. So if I want to deploy that to test, I can say test and build, and now it's gonna deploy that to test. And in a second, you'll see that it shows up there. So, and, and it's promoted that image as well. So that's the next thing, right? You can do more, less simplistic workloads with this, but it all works very simple, uh, very, in a very straightforward way. Um, and that code, like I said, is the same. You know, it didn't change the, the container, it didn't rebuild the container, it just added a tag to the end of the name and deployed it. And so I can, there it is, there it is, right there. So we have a very simple workflow that's enabled by something like Docker, well, by Docker, and, um, and tools that we ship, so Swarm, Compose, machine create, Docker machine actually created the machines that this is running on and ran, and then we ran Jenkins and Postgres and whatever uh, as well. Our Jenkins container has all the jobs already baked into it, it's pretty nice. So questions? Yes? So, that looks like crap. So, <laughs> so we did an explicit mapping here, right? If you don't do an explicit mapping, if you just say run a container that has port 8080 inside of it, but map it to some random port on the outside, then you can run as many containers with port 8080 as you want, as long as you, you know, as much resources as you have, right? So I can run 20 instances of NGINX that are running on port 8080, and it doesn't matter because they're all mapped on the host to unique ports, right? So in, in this example, we're actually using that feature, right? So I'm gonna find the right place, but. Um, so right here is where we run the Docker thing. This is all garbage to most people, but 
the most important thing with regard to this question about running multiple things with multiple ports is this dash capital P, which just says map all the ports that have expose in there. You know, the Docker file has this expose thing. Map all those ports into random ports on the host, right? And so um, I don't, in this instance, wh when we run this command, uh, which is rather long, we're, we're not actually specifying what port it listens on because we don't care. Um, the interlock container, which is the load balancer, is all that cares about what port those things are running on, and it's configuring itself, right? So we're actually removing wads of configuration at the same time. And when you don't give a damn about a lot of things, it's so much, life is so good, you know? It's like, <laughs> what, that, I don't care, whatever. And, and the nice thing is like, these are all completely isolated from one another. The test doesn't know about the dev, doesn't know about the prod. I can run all these on the same machines, right? I don't have to think about that. It's just a pool of stu stuff to put my bits in, right? I don't give a damn about any of it. So it's, it's important to, to note that, you know, a lot of people think this is like, oh, Wild West, anybody can run anything, and yes, they can. That's the whole point. <laughs> it's not going to affect your infrastructure one iota, and it doesn't affect security, and I've got a whole other talk about security. What they're putting in their container only affects what's inside their container. And, you know, on the unlikely event of a breakout from C groups and namespaces in the kernel, which there have been like three since Docker started, and they've all been mitigated within about a day, you know, you're not gonna run the risk of anything in your environment like getting screwed up, right? You're not running a whole operating system inside that container. You're, you're running a, a Unix process inside that container. So you have a, a ton of flexibility and you have a lot more abstraction away from everything, right? You're abstracted from the operating system, you're abstracted from the hardware in the case of Amazon because you're running in a virtual machine, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So somebody over here had a question, yeah? In the cloud, I'm running four virtual machines, uh, four machines that are running Swarm. So each node runs Swarm. There's actually five machines because one is running like Jenkins and other stuff. So, so the way Swarm works is it's a very simple um, agent that is basically a proxy to um, a health check. So it, it just says, I'm gonna go register to a key value store somewhere. It doesn't care where it is. And it just says what port number Docker is running on, on on what IP. So when you join the cluster, that's all it does. And then it does a health check every, I forget how many seconds, I think two seconds or something, to make sure that it's still supposed to be there. Um, and so, and it runs in a container, right? <laughs> so. It's it's really it's literally a Docker run swarm join and here's my where my key value store is and that's it. So starting a cluster is, you know, and you can use Docker machine to do it too. With there's a dash dash swarm thing, and you can start a swarm cluster in about five seconds, you know, or however long it takes for Amazon or whoever to start machines. Yeah. Right, so, and this is, so he, his question is about resource management, basically. Can I do things to it on the fly? Um, currently, you, you can do things on the fly, but not through Docker. You'd have to go and edit the, 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 the resource mappings inside the, the definition um, uh, in real time on the proc file system, right? You can go and change these things. Um, that is a, an often requested feature, but it's not there yet. Uh, go write it, and we'll merge it. That, thanks for volunteering. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, 
So you can run docker exec, which will run a, a process inside of an existing container. Um, so you could run like cat blah, 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 or whatever. But um, from a, d so the question is how do I change what's running in a container for like a development environment? So what I normally say for like a dynamic language, like a Node.js app or something like that, you mount in from the host, you mount in the code. Um, you can, in theory, go in and hack things around, but really, if you want to change what's in the container, fix the Docker file and rebuild the container. Right? And then th that's, a, that's an interesting thing because when you're, when you're building and playing with containers, you don't ever upgrade a container. You just throw it away. It's totally ephemeral. It's totally a useless piece of garbage. Right? You build a new one and you run the new thing and you throw the old one away. Um, they're not pets. They're not pets. They're not pets. You don't run Ansible inside a container. You don't run SSH inside a container. You don't run, you, you want them to be just ephemeral environments, as ephemeral and stateless as possible, right? So state needs to be outside the container uh, at a database or in a key value store or you know, on your mom's laptop or whatever. And then, and then everything else just, you don't care about it, right? So there's so much freedom involved in not giving a damn. <laughs> I don't care about my virtual machines. I don't care about any of that stuff. If it goes away, it goes away. I expect it to go away, right? Your expectation level changes. And just, so I used to work for Microsoft at uh, Live Search, right? We had 500,000 machines when I worked there. I don't know how they are now, but there were five admins, which meant we could give a damn if a machine disappeared. I could give a damn if 10,000 machines disappeared, right? I, I would like to know, but it, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's more like, oh crap, is, is that gonna happen over here too, right? It's not, I need to get these back up now because I didn't care, right? I would never log into a machine, that's stupid, right? So, so this is my mentality, but I think Docker enables that mentality in a lot of places where you didn't have it before, right? These are not pets. Don't love your machine. It's gonna go away and it's gonna die a f terrible, horrible, fiery death. <laughs> so go play with Docker. What? <laughs> so I just started a bunch of containers and then I stopped the old ones. So it's sort of a, this isn't in any formal way. This is very a very naive way of deploying things, right? But on purpose, right? So if I if I really cared, I would have a lock somewhere that said, "Hey, go, you know, replace one at a time," that kind of thing, or have like a red green or whatever the hell it is, purple purple puce, whatever. I don't care what. Yeah, the load balancer. So when the container dies, it just throws it out, right? Um, because it's reading from the swarm clusters event stream. If, if, a, if a container disappears, it's gone, and it removes it from the configuration, right? So it may fail a health check before that, if, if the timing, you know, if the timing is right, there's a little bit of a race, but it, it's, it's an irrelevant race because we're gonna get, get rid of it anyway. So the, I love load balancers. I think they're the best thing since sliced bread, and um, when they're running in containers and they break, I don't care because I can throw them away, right? And start a new one and it just generates its configuration, right? So, um, yeah. Yep. Do I consider Docker Compose production ready? Uh, I have customers that are very large that are running Docker Compose stuff in production, sure. <laughs> I mean, it works for them. Um, yeah, I don't know about our sites, but yeah. Um, I think production ready is such a subjective thing. You have to figure it out. Like, is it working? Is it working consistently? Great, go do it. Ah, whatever. Yeah. So Docker toolbox right now and the Docker command, the Docker client, 
So Docker is a client server architecture, right? But the, the client is basically the server, et cetera. Uh, Docker, the Docker client works fine on Windows right now. Um, on Windows 2016, Microsoft has um, changed their kernel with us. We have people with, uh, with them and they have people with us. They are actually the lar second largest or largest, depending on the week, contributor to Docker at the moment. Um, they're the first group of people within Microsoft to do any significant development on an open source project. So um, new Microsoft guys, this is impressive. So they're, um, this is annoying. Go away, whatever. Um, so with Windows 2016, you'll be able to run Docker containers on Windows. You'll be running Windows containers on Windows, but so you can containerize Windows applications. Uh, server-side applications, using something called Windows Nano, which is a, a very small version of Windows that's meant to run containers. And it, there's, a, there's actually a tech preview out right now that is public, so anybody can go grab it and play with it. Anything else? Yes. So the, the way that PubFed and Chef and Ansible and configuration management work with respect to Docker, um, it's not that they're bad, right? It's that you don't need them inside of the container, right? So something still has to take care of the host as much as they're not pets. Like we actually do want them to run for more than five minutes. So, um, you know, that that's where the boundary stops. Like. So uh, Ansible has a lot of really cool features around orchestrating containers. Um, their plugin system is really good and, and very mature on the Docker side. The others are coming as well, so everybody's working on it. But um, the boundary is typically what runs on the host is what, where Ansible lives, and then what runs in the container is baked into the container already. So you're not, like, you're not, you're not, like crossing the streams, so to speak. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Thank you everybody for coming.